Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much. Are you happy this morning? Yes. Is die Afrikaanse kinderkies? As sy. So Shell sal het tweetalig doen. Auntie Shell will do it in both languages. I'll try. Okay. So you all go to school. Do you go to school? Do you like school? Yes. Why do you like school? Isn't it boring? You have your friends. You've got your friends. Yes. And what will we... Yes, you get to learn about what? About what? Math. Do you like math? Mm. Don't like counting. Yes. Yes. And languages and people and the world outside. Okay. Now, usually, we've got friends. Do you all have friends? So you're not alone at school. Okay. Okay. But little Tommy was alone. He was a little, peculiar little guy. He sat with break every time he sat alone. So Tommy was baie alleen. He was baie eensam. Omdat hy anders as die ander maaikies was. So one day, two friends came. And they sat there and they said, Tommy, why are you sitting alone? Hoekom sit jy alleen? Het jy nie maaikies nie? But they were actually very rude. Hulle was bykie ongeskik met hom. Gesê, het jy nie maaikies nie? Is jy snaaks? Met wie sit jy en praat? Do you have an imaginary friend? You're always talking to yourself. What's going on? So Tommy was very quiet and shy and he said, You know what? I've, I do have a friend. They said, Wee, I don't see anybody. I think you're very peculiar. You're weird. So he said, Come a little closer. So guys, come, come closer, come here. Come sit closer, sit there, come here. Maar hulle was bykie skrikkerig vir Tommy nie, so hulle wou nie te na by sit nie. You're still a bit far. But he was actually happy in his heart because he said, now somebody's a bit closer to me. Would you like to meet my friend? And they were actually, no, not really, because it's a bit weird. Where's your friend? This is weird. So he said, come a bit closer. So he said, come nader, come nader. So everybody had nice lunch. But Tommy wasn't rich. He was not rich. He had a nice peanut butter sandwich. And mommy used to teach him that sharing is caring. So the other friends, they didn't want to share their lunch with him because they ate everything. But he used to share his lunch with his friend. So now they were watching him and they said, now who's your friend? What's in your door? An ant. It's an ant. It's a mir. So he was talking to the ant. And they were coming closer and saying, okay, let's see who's this Who's this? Oh, it's a little ant. And he was actually sharing his peanut butter sandwich with the ant. And talking to the ant every single day. So they said to him, now we feel bad. Ek voel nou so slecht, Tommy. Kan ek talk iets met jou deel, maar ek het nou niks om met jou te deel nie. Ek het my hele brooikie opgeëet. We ate everything. What can we share with you? So he said, you can share something with me, and you actually are sharing something with me. You are now sharing conversation with me. Jylle is nou bezig om met my te praat. En nou is jylle bezig om met my ook iets te deel. So he said, come a bit closer. Kom sit die by my. Kom, come closer. Come. Come sit close, close, close. I want to feel you. Come here, come here. Come, close. Come sit with Auntie Sha. Come. Ah, now we're not cold anymore. Can I shake your hand? Can I go, Auntie Skit? Ah, great stuff. High five. Yes, give me a hug. Come here. Mm. Ah, shake. Give me a hug. So now we're sharing. We're sharing friendship, isn't it? And we're sharing hugs. And you're talking to me. So sometimes we don't need to give somebody bread. 
we need to give them a hug. Ons moet liefies vir mense, nee. Ons moet hulle drukkie gee. And sometimes we can reach each other. Of ons kan vir mekaar bid. So are we going to share a prayer together now? Will you give the little ant a bit of real bread? Yes. Thank you. And the little birdie, will you put him back in his nest? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so let's share a prayer. Thank you, dear Jesus, for giving us your love. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing your love. And thank you, Jesus, for being my best friend. Amen. Good morning, church. I want to thank the Lord for allowing me to come and worship with you. I need to thank you, Pastor Donovan for asking me to stand in for him. And uh, thank you for the message on, uh, through music on grace. Indeed, uh, uh, God is grace. He is uh, great. I am delighted also to see Pastor uh, our our former pastor, the, the name is gone. <laughs> pastor Dalbok, Pastor Dalbok, and uh, Mrs. Dalbok. Thank you so much. Um, I have heard that uh, there are some people who ask, the, you know, who wonder, you know, what I'm doing with my team there at the E.G. White Center. Uh, I think they try to, to think of what we are doing there. They see us going there in the morning, going back home, and so on. Um, in case there are some in the audience today, today who may also be asking themselves what we are doing there, since uh, not so many people frequent our place there, I think uh, uh, our two books that we have just uh, you know, published in the last two years uh, speak for uh, what we are doing there. Uh, this one was launched uh, this year on January 30th, Understanding a Prophet. This uh, book is in two parts. The first part um, introduces Ellen White and the second part presents uh, about 28 topics, readings on the spirit of prophecy or the writings of Ellen White. Uh, we are custodians of um, the writings of Ellen White. Of course, they are copies, so that uh, our division should have access to our writings. Of course, uh, this was necessary, you know, uh, to, to be near the church members to be near, you know, uh, us in, in this territory uh, from 1983 when the center was established. But of course, uh, in these days, since 2015, everything we have there is available online. So you may not even, even have to come to, to our place there. If you have uh, internet, you go to EGW Writings, you'll be able to access everything. So uh, you can always come there to see the hard copies, but you can also access the, the writings online. But uh, we also try to, um, it is our duty also to try to remind members about the importance of the spirit of prophecy and uh, to try to make available to uh, to the members, the spirit of prophecy, and also to help in explaining, interpreting, and so on. So this is why uh, while we are a research center, we are expecting people to come there and do research, but we also do research so that we can be of service to the church. Amen? So this is the one aspect of our work. The other aspect of our work is probably represented by this book, uh, which was uh, uh, launched last year in March, March 1. Uh, this is the, uh, the title is the Echoes from Table Mountain. Now, I think we know Table Mountain. Uh, 
This book is about uh, the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in South Africa during the first 50 years from 1870 to 1920 when the African division was established. So everything in between is covered in this book. Again, trying to remind our church of how our church started here in South Africa because this was the gateway of our church into uh, into southern part of Africa. From here, our church went to Zimbabwe, to Zambia, to Malawi, to Angola, to Congo. Uh, so it's always uh, you know, nice to uh, refresh our memories or to uh, tell our children how our church you know, began in Africa, especially in the southern part. Um, so, in addition to uh, the publication of a book like this, Echoes from Table Mountains, we have also been involved in, the, in the writing articles on the history of our church in SID. Uh, so far, we have about 100 articles published online. If you go to encyclopedia.adventist.org, You'll be able to read about uh, Helder Bay College, how it started, and where it is today. You read about, uh, you know, our conferences, the union, and even our country, South Africa, and then uh, other uh, institutions and, uh, and, and the countries within SID. So you just go to encyclopedia.adventist.org, then you'll be able to search there. Worldwide, we have more than 4,000 articles already published online. But of course, uh, you know, we were working towards a goal of 8,500. So we are still on our way to finishing the work. And you also find there photos uh, in the, uh, about 7,500 photos are there including Helderberg, including you know, our old institutions like Claremont Sanitarium, you know, uh, Plumstead Sanitarium, and many others. So uh, if you have internet, you can always uh, go there and uh, en enrich your knowledge and also your memory about our church. Anyway, enough of that. I think now we can come to our message for this morning. I think let's, let us begin with a prayer. Dear Lord, we have come in your presence and we long to hear from you, Lord, as you speak through the message that you have impressed upon my heart, Lord. I pray that it will be a blessing to your people and that it will also Help us to do our part as we see the time running out because Jesus is coming very soon. Now, in line with uh, our responsibility there, our work, I thought I should do, uh, speak on uh, one of the important visions of Ellen White. If we can have the PowerPoint on, so that we travel with her from the time she was given the vision and how her work expanded. So I want to look at one of the important visions of Ellen White. This is the Great Controversy vision and how it led to the development of the Conflict of the Ages series. I think the five books, uh, we know them, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, um, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and Great Controversy. I think we, well, we need to know that uh, by the time Ellen White died, she left approximately 100,000 pages of written work. 
100,000 pages of written work. And these have been published in different books, and some of you may have several titles in your library. And sometimes, since we see all of them you know, at a go, we don't know, you know what, which came first, you know, which leads to what. And so reading becomes confusing sometimes. I hope that uh, this development of the five books, the Conflict of the Ages series, will help us uh, have an idea of you know, why some statements can be found in this book and that book and that book, you know, is kind of, you know, confusing sometimes. You may think that, you know, she was repeating herself. So maybe for our uh, biblical foundation, really the verse that I, I was supposed to read, uh, I didn't read, sorry. That's uh, Amos 3 and verse 7. Surely the Lord does nothing without revealing his plan through his servants, the prophets. So God decide, uh, works in such a way that he does not uh, take us by surprise. I think if you go back to the Old Testament, um, you see this repeated, you know, before the flood came, God sent warning through Noah. Before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, you know, the angels went into Sodom and Gomorrah to go and, you know, see what was going on and even rescue Loti and his two daughters. So they, they repeat, you know, God always, you know, uh, comes to warn us of what he is going to do so that he does not take us by surprise. So even in these last days, yes, we have our Bible, but God always wants to be, uh, to meet us where we are, to meet us where we are. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, we are told that the spiritual gifts are given for the common good of the church. Prophecy works within the confines of the church generally. It is for the benefit of the church. So the Apostle Paul also wrote that he, he who prophesies edifies the church. So prophecy is for the warning, for the edification of the church, for preparation of the church for, for service. But the prophetic visions are useless unless they are interpreted for all to understand. I think in the case of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, in the case of uh, Pharaoh's dreams, you know, you see how uh, desperate one gets to know that I had a dream, a very important dream, but I don't understand it. So someone must be there to, uh, to, to explain or to interpret. So even when we talk about Ellen White, yes, she wrote in English, Yes, she lived in, not long ago, about a hundred years ago. And yet when we meet those writings, you sometimes speak like an Ethiopian eunuch who said, how can I understand unless someone explains to me? So first we look at Ellen White, how she viewed herself. Some people wanted to confirm, are you a prophet or what, who are you? So she says this, yes, my commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does, it does not end there. It embraces much more. And especially in our days, when you say I'm a prophet, you know, the kind of understanding of a prophet we know today is even contrary to what was understood in the Bible. So Ellen White accepted the fact that yes, I am, but my work embraces more. And I think we can tell from the volume of work that she, has, she had to do. And then uh, there were some who were accusing her of being influenced by her husband, by her children, by some people. She says, I'm just as dependent upon the spirit of the Lord in relating or writing a vision as I am as in having the vision. Because there were some who were saying that if James White is not there, she cannot have a vision. 
you know, people come up with all kinds of insinuations, all kinds of, you know, uh, speculations. So she says, I'm dependent on the Holy Spirit to receive the vision and also to communicate it. I am being led by the Holy Spirit. So, as I mentioned, the Ellen White, we are told that by the time of her death, she had about 2,000 dreams and visions. About 2,000 dreams and visions. So one of the important visions that she had was the Great Controversy Vision. The Great Controversy Vision. On March 13 and 14, 1858, James and Erin White were in Ohio attending meetings at places like Green Spring, Gilboa, and Lovett's Grove. On Sunday, and uh, well, on, on Sabbath, actually, they were at Lovett's Grove. So on Sunday, James White conducted a funeral, a funeral service in a schoolhouse. There was a family that lost a child. So he conducted the, the funeral service. When he finished, Ellen White felt impressed by the spirit to say a few words to encourage the, you know, uh, the mourning family. As she spoke, she spoke about the second coming of Christ, the resurrection, and the cheering hope of the Christians uh, very well. But then she was taken into a vision, a vision which lasted two hours. Now you can imagine, you know, you are in a funeral service, people, the sermon has been given, people are now ready to go and bury, and then she goes into a vision which lasts two hours. Well, we may probably not want to probe into what happened then, did they leave and so on, but we want to know what message did she receive in that vision of two hours. Now, her visions were not that long all the time. Of course, one that was longer than this lasted for four hours because there were people who were trying to see if they could stop her from having the vision. And so the, the vision went on and on for four hours. But uh, somewhere very short, somewhere as short as one minute. But this one lasted two hours. What was the message? In the vision, uh, the vision unfolded the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And she, uh, she had seen this vision 10 years before in 1848, because this was now 1858. Uh, but this time, more details were given her uh, regarding the great controversy. For the first time, she was told to write out the vision. And uh, she was warned that Saturn would make strong efforts to hinder, to hinder her, but the angels of God would help her. Now, for us to understand the magnitude of this vision, all Ellen White's writings are developed under the theme we call Great Controversy Theme, Great Controversy Theme. Even today, Adventist theology is built around this theme, understanding that uh, rebellion took place in heaven, and uh, in our understanding of prophecy, we follow what is called uh, the historicist you know, approach. We see history not uh, repeating itself in cycles, but uh, moving from one point to another. So from the rebellion in heaven, uh, the fall in, into sin of Adam and Eve, the coming of Christ, we are going to the climax when Jesus will come and to the end of sin and ev everything. So what helps us to understand all that is happening and God is acts or God's involvement in saving humanity. It's the great controversy theme. Imaging or coming out of that vision, the great controversy vision. It helps us to understand why are we going through suffering? Why is there death? What is the future like? It is from this 
great controversy theme, uh, built on this vision, and which also helps us to understand that uh, there is a controversy going on, and we are part and parcel of that uh, controversy. So after they left Lovett's Grove, they began going back to Michigan, where they were staying. And this was two days later on March 16, when they stopped at a place called Jackson, Jackson Station. Uh, you know, this is the railway road station. And there, there was Daniel and Abigail Palmer. These were the first, uh, some of the first converts in Michigan, you know, brought to our faith by Joseph Bates. So they stopped there to encourage them, spend a the night there. But while they, while they were there, Ellen White was struck with the paralysis. You know, her left arm and leg just became useless because of that uh, almost what we may call a stroke. But uh, with the prayers offered for her, she felt much better. And then the second day, they were on their way to Michigan. After they arrived there, Ellen White struggled to begin writing the vision as she was instructed in the vision. She began to write a page at a, on a day, and by June of that same year, 1858, uh, she received another vision, which helped her understand why she suffered that uh, you know, paralysis. It actually, the vision revealed that Saturn wanted to take her her life and to hinder the writing of the vision. So you can see that uh, because the, for her to write out the vision, it would reveal certain work, certain uh, schemes. And so he was to fight to hinder the, the writing of the vision. However, as we know, you know she uh, successfully completed the writing. And so from 1858, the publication of uh, the development of that writing, 1858, she, she published the Speech of Gifts, Volume 1. Uh, and then 1860, Volume 2, 1864, Volume 3, 1864 again, Volume 4 was also published. And some of you, you may have, you know, these volumes in your library. So really, this is the development of uh, her writing of the vision, the great controversy vision. And then in the 1870s, uh, they were renamed into, uh, as the Spirit of Prophecy. Volume 1 in 1870, Volume 2 in 1877, and volume three in 1878, volume four in 1884. So if you have the spirit of prof, uh, spirit, uh, the spiritual gifts volumes, and then you also have this set, just know that uh, these are built on the spiritual gifts volumes. You know, they are not uh, different from each other. It's a, you know, continuous development. They are expanded but it's given different names. Now, as we come to the 1880s, the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, which you can see uh, right there, was, uh, was covering a period from the first century to the time of the Reformation in the 1500s. And then this same volume in 1884 became uh, the first volume of the five conflict series, which is a great controversy. Now that can be, that sounds confusing because the great controversy is supposed to be the last volume, isn't it? But uh, it was the first one to be developed in 1884. And during uh, the, this same period, church members began to share these books with the non-Adventists, non-Adventists. And this led to revisions so that it would, uh, you know, when, when we speak among ourselves, we use a certain language, a jargon, which outsiders cannot understand. But when you begin to speak to outsiders, 
you have to adjust because they, they will not understand your jargon, the language that you, you are familiar with. So Ellen White's you know, books went through you know, revision to be able to accommodate the understanding of non-Adventists. And so from this uh, 1884, it, uh, the, the Great Controversy was uh, published, and between 1885 and 1887, Volume 4 was reprinted 10 times. Um, and it also had 20 pages of illustrations, which was actually the first time her, write, her books, you know, uh, began to include the illustrations. And all this was to make them, you know, uh, appeal to the general public and also to make them easily understandable. So as you come to 1890, then you have the part, uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, which became Patriarchs and the Prophets, uh, as you can see there, with 754 pages. Now you have two volumes of the conflict series. And then Patriarchs and the Prophets is said to be regarded to be equal to the Great Controversy. Because when you are looking at uh, the end of the controversy, you also want to understand the beginning of the controversy. So Patriarchs and the Prophets helps us to understand how the conflict started in heaven and how it came down to this earth. In Great Controversy, we see how it will end. So these two are really like book ends. You know, they hold the whole story together. And of course, Volume 2 and 3 became uh, the foundation for Life of Christ series. series. So N. White also uh, developed, you know, spent time in writing on the life of Christ. Um, so from 1895, she began working on that, uh, drawing materials from her previously pu uh, published materials, uh, and also from even unpublished manuscripts. So from 1896, you have thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Then 1898, you have Desire of Ages. And then 1900, you have Crisis Object Lessons. And in 1905, you have Ministry of Healing. All those books, all those four books are really covering the life and the ministry of Christ while he was here on the earth. I think one important aspect is that uh, the Desire of Ages with 835 pages forms a part of the Great Controversy story. It's actually now the third volume. The third volume, we have Great Controversy, we have Patriarchs and Prophets, then we have Desire of Ages in order of their development. And why is this important? In it, she reveals why a member of the Godhead became Jesus. You know, Christ was not called Jesus in heaven. When the, the prediction of his birth was uh, announced, that's when it, the name was also given. You will call him who? Jesus. Because he will save his people from, from their sins. Yes, Emmanuel, <laughs> that's very true as well. Yeah. So this book explains why Jesus had to come or uh, one member of the God had become Jesus, a uh, humanity savior. And in this book also, she clarified the divinity of Christ, stating on the page 530, in Christ is life, original, and borrowed, and derived. You remember that if, you know, before this period, most of the pioneers were actually uh, anti-Trinitarian, they did not believe in the Trinity. Talk about James White and Joseph Bates and all others. But Ellen White in this book clarified that Christ did not have a beginning. He was part of the Godhead. But of course, we are still fighting over this. You know, there are some people who cannot agree with this. And then completing the conflict series, in 1911, you have the final revision of the Great Controversy. Final revision of the Great Controversy, leaving uh, it at 678 pages. 
And in 1911, also, you have the Acts of the Apostles with the 600, 602 pages. It was also published. Now you have four of the five conflict series. And in 1917, Prophets and Kings was also published with 733 pages. Now, of course, you know, some of you will not already that Ellen White died in 1915, but this book was published two years later. Now, the work had already started. Actually, the work did not stop because Ellen White died. No, in her will, in her last will, she constituted the board of trustees to continue her work of public, uh, publications even after her death. So this volume was almost complete when she died, and it was published two years after her death. So now we see how from that vision of 1858, Ellen White's writings develop, uh, continued to develop until we have these five volumes. Plus, remember, remember those others, crisis object lessons, um, Ministry of Healing, and also Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. They also form part of this uh, uh, great controversy uh, theme series. And then uh, listen to what uh, Ellen White says about uh, the great controversy. In 1905, in letter 281, she, she wrote, which you can also find in Kaupota Ministry, page 127. She wrote, she said, the great controversy, meaning the book, should be very widely circulated. It contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. I'm more anxious to see a wide circulation of, for this book than any others I have written. For in the great controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any other of my books. So yes, she has all these five conflict cities, and there are many others. We haven't talked about the testimonies here. They were also developed along the way. But she lifts this out of all of them. She says she's anxious to have this book widely distributed because in it, it gives the story of the controversy in the past, in the present, and in the future. And then in 1911, she says, the book, The Great Controversy, I appreciate above silver or gold, and I greatly desire that it shall come before the people. While writing the manuscript of the great controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God. And many times, the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night, so that they were fresh and vivid. So you can see it's as if God paid more attention to the development of this book, such that uh, she was being aided by the presence of the angels to get this book, you know, uh, completed. And of course, when she began writing in 1858, uh, she was attacked by, the, by Satan, trying to hinder. So God, as it were, guarded the development of this book so that uh, it will speak to the people. And of course, Probably in our audience today, there may be some who were brought into the, in, into the Adventist church through reading this book because, you know, God really wanted to speak to the world uh, with the message that is contained in this book. And what is her admonition to us? She says, the volumes of spirit of prophecy that is the great controversy. And also the testimonies should be introduced 
into every Sabbath-keeping family, our families. So this great controversy book and, every, and, and the testimonies should be introduced into every Sabbath-keeping family, and the brethren should know their value and be urged to read them. It was not the wisest plan to place these books at a low figure, in other words, low price, and have, and have only one set in a church. They should be in the library of every family and be read again and again. Let them be kept where they can be read by many. So we are encouraged to have these books in our homes and not only have them, but to read them as well. And not only read them as a family, but also share with our neighbors, with uh, those that uh, come to visit us. They must be placed where people can easily have access to them and be able to read. Back in 1890, in connection with this book, she said, the results of the circulation of this book the great controversy, are not to be judged by what now appears. By reading it, some souls will be aroused and will have courage to unite themselves at once with those who keep the commandments of God. But a much larger number who read, who read it will not take their position until they see the very events taking place that are foretold in it. The fulfillment of some of the predictions will inspire faith that others also will come to pass. And when the earth is lightened with the glory of the Lord, in the closing wake, many souls will take their position on the commandments of God as a result of this agency. So what is our duty? Our duty is to make the book available to people. They may not respond right away. They may not appear to be interested now. Leave the book with them. Kapotas have said, this is a silent messenger. It will speak even when you are sleeping. But when the events foretold in the book begin to pass as they are not right now, people will take their stand because they have received the message. And then our prayers, our longings will be fulfilled then. But we hope that as they take their stand, we also take our stand because we have read those books and have been made ready for the coming of the Lord. Well, where are the books? Maybe that's the, that may be the question. Don't worry, there is a, a project uh, uh, prepared by the General Conference called Great Controversy, uh, Great Controversy 2.0. Great Controversy 2.0. Next year and the following year, the, the plan is for the church to distribute as many copies of the Great Controversy as possible. Next year and 2024, all of us, total member involvement, we are to participate in distributing the book, Great Controversy. So at least we have had, you know, a compacted idea of the development of these books. Yes, they have the message that we are supposed to give to the world. So God calls upon us to be involved in making these books available. May God bless us as we take part, because it is by being involved that we are transformed and also made ready for the coming of the Lord. Thank you. Let us pray. Our loving Father who is in heaven, indeed, it must be the breaking of the day. We see the condition of the world. We see the signs for feeding. Lord, we know that without you, we can do nothing. We pray that instead of being filled with fear, that we may be filled with joy because Jesus is coming again. 
We pray, dear Lord, that uh, you fill us with your spirit, you give us the latter rain to prepare us for the breaking of the day. But Lord, we pray that you may also use us, send us out in the lands and highways to prepare people for the breaking of the day. Oh Lord, we pray that uh, you will use us as instruments in preparing this world for your coming. And we pray, Lord, that uh, when you come, we may all together as families and individuals and everyone who longs for your appearing, we may be saved into your kingdom. This is our humble prayer, and Lord, we pray that you keep us faithful until you come to take us home. Bless us on this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you once again, Pastor Ashilinga, for giving us the background to the conflict series and reminding us about the importance of this message that we need to take to the world. And to put that to practice, um, I will ask the media team to put the, the number for the church office and my personal number up on the board and in the video for the um, people watching on YouTube. And if you need access to the Great Controversy series, you can speak directly to me, no problem. We have stock, we have material, and we are willing to share it with anybody in any amount you need it.